Senegal's Lions are among the favourites to win this year's Africa Cup of Nations. The football event kicks off on January 9th in Cameroon after a delay due to COVID. Senegal's president Macky Sall put pressure on his team to bring back the title after losing two finals in 2000 and 2019. We are going to Cameroon with our commitment and that of an entire nation. We're going with a lot of ambition and desire. We're going with the will to win, to borrow soccer jargon. And we would return with the pride of a mission accomplished, Mr. President. The team postponed their arrival over three cases of COVID-19. But they aren't the only ones starting off the competition with coronavirus-related complications. The Gambia missed two warm-up matches and Nigeria will have to do without its striker. Victor Osimhen. While 2004 winners Tunisia started off well, the team was then hit by two infections. Amid a global surge in cases due to the Omicron variant, the African Football Confederation set down draconian rules. Spectators must be fully vaccinated and show a negative PCR test. And stadium capacity will be capped at 80% when Cameroon's indomitable Lions play, and 60% for other matches. Five-time winners of the cup, host country Cameroon hopes to win again this year. It's a trophy that is very difficult to win. There are many teams that can win this trophy with players that play in the biggest clubs in Europe. So obviously winning it would be something magical. Cameroon was due to stage the tournament in 2019, but fell behind on preparations, with Egypt stepping in to host at the last minute. The country wants to prove it has rectified the situation. Yet security is a key issue, with authorities struggling with separatist gunmen in the west and jihadist raiders in the north. Some fear militants will seize on the country's moment in the sporting spotlight to launch attacks. The civil war in the Central African Republic has switched gears. The long-running conflict between rebels and government forces has been driven out of the main cities to the northwest of the country. Armed groups are increasingly resorting to guerrilla tactics, concealing life-threatening mines underground to slow the advance of pro-government forces. UN peacekeepers are on guard in the face of this new threat. Since August 2021, there have been 13 mine-related incidents. Out of these 13 incidents, there were five explosions, and out of the five explosions, there were four with casualties. Eight people died, including two women and a five-year-old child, and two were injured. UN forces interview villagers to collect information on the possible positioning of mines. We haven't heard of any explosive devices, but if we do, we will notify MINUSCA. What is certain is that the rebels are in the bush and we can no longer go out to the field. We need protection. Complex and costly, MINUSCA, the UN's peacekeeping operation in the country, has suspended demining operations until further notice. Their only option is to fly over areas marked with explosives. But helicopters are not able to transport all the humanitarian aid needed. In September, a Danish refugee council convoy was blown up by a mine. Humanitarian aid worker Augustin Nadusha was on board. These photos show the impact of the explosion. Suddenly, I heard an unusual sound. It was really striking. That's how I woke up. I just removed the seatbelt to free myself. I looked around. I found the lady next to me covered in blood, crying. I could see parts of the vehicle rolling, falling. Then I pulled myself head first out of the vehicle so I could leave the vehicle first. As a result, entire districts are without humanitarian aid. Motorbike taxi drivers are among the only people to venture out on these dangerous roads. In the northwest, motorbikes are the only means of transport for people and goods. The young people riding them aren't able to find any other work and are paying a heavy price. One was recently killed after driving over a mine. The entire northwest region faces shortages and famine. The World Food Programme has organized food airdrops there, where most of the population are going hungry.
The search for the pride has gone on over many kilometers. Kevin Leo Smith manages these five and a half thousand hectares of savanna near South Africa's famous Kruger Park. Trackers have spotted the cats feasting on a prey. Yeah, it's a zebra carcass. I nearly finished it. The mission is to capture and sterilize a lioness. Lions are top predators here in Reedsbrute. There is little competition and abundant food. They are endangered on the continent, but in South Africa's smaller reserves, lions are multiplying too fast. The management is taking drastic measures to limit their numbers and keep the gene pool healthy. We have to therefore manage this population to not end up in a, what we'd call a prey trap, where there are too many lions and not enough prey species. Another big risk is inbreeding. They will start coming on heat and they would end up mating with their own fathers. So that's why we uh, need to prevent that. In the natural circumstances, that wouldn't happen because the males would have been displaced by other males. A dart gun is loaded with strong sedatives. Yes. In a few minutes, the lion drifts off. On the other side of the reserve, the three males also sleep. For now, they have little to worry about. Only a few hyena and cheetahs threaten their dominance. But they too will be caught up in the population control scheme. In a few years, young males from a different reserve will replace them. Rootsbreed is part of a network of public and private reserves, the Lion Management Forum. They mimic natural processes by controlling reproduction rates and swapping males. They totally and total have about 700 lions. That is increasing at roughly about 2% a year. If we didn't do the management that we were doing in that place, the population will be increasing at 22% a year. Uh, now that sounds really nice, but the trouble is I don't have lots of space for that in South Africa. In the operating theater, veterinarians start the procedure. It's a complicated operation. Several hours later, the doctors take out only a part of her reproductive system, not the entire uterus, as was planned. We did immobilize her and we did it with the, you know, she did have a full stomach. And uh, it just made the op a lot more difficult, so we just took the ovaries out, yeah. So it's a very invasive technique, but as soon as you've got four fences around a place, you have to, um, you have to manage it. After the surgery, the lioness is brought to a separate enclosure. She will stay here until her wound has healed. It will be several weeks before she can hunt again. South Africa's 3,500 lions make up 17% of the global population. Interventions like this allow the numbers to grow at least 2% a year, a rate that the land and the ecosystem can carry.